Anana Returns, Chapter 9, Marduk and War Marduk, the eldest son of Anki, is the last man in the galaxy I would ever want as a husband. Anki, who loved life and women of all races, produced many, many children. All of these children competed with each other for lands, kingdoms, armies, and wealth. My late husband, Dumuzi, who was the youngest of the principal children, was safely dead and no longer a threat to the others. Nurgle, married to my half-sister, Areshkigal, was second in the line to power. Anki even produced a child by his daughter-in-law, Areshkigal. Perhaps that is how she received the underworld where Nurgle ruled with her. There were countless other children by Anki, a veritable snake pit of bickering brothers and sisters. And then there was Marduk, who claimed everything for himself. Some might think Marduk was from Mars. Whatever Marduk's actual genes were, he was, a, he was born a natural reptilian tyrant. He came right out of his mother's womb calculating how he was going to control everything and everybody. All the classic reptilian traits seemed to come together in one big Marduk. Marduk is very tall with piercing red eyes and golden olive skin. That is a little on the scaly side. He has the remnants of gills on his cheeks. Originally, he was born with a tail like his father, Anki. But later in life, he had the tail removed by laser, laser surgery. He claimed the tail merely got in his way. But we all knew it was sheer vanity that drove him. Many find Mardu exquisitely beautiful, coldly magnificent, with a brilliant mind and the focus of a cobra. He does possess a kind of beauty, if you like that sort. The sons of Anki were always quarreling with each other, even as children. As Anki and his brother Enlil fought over power, so did their children. There might be temporary alliances, but sooner or later one would want to have his own way and brothers would come to blows. As children, some of the boys received terrible wounds from those little toy plasma guns. A few of the rivaling mothers taught their children how to place thought forms of imaginary demons in the dreams of the other little ones. The women learned that if their sons held power, so would the mothers, and they began to neglect their daughters, seeking only powerful marriages for the poor things. A family gathering was usually a chaotic disaster, occasionally achieving the magnitude of a riot. The boys would fight and their mothers would egg them on. Anki usually retired in fear and despair. He never liked to discipline anyone. After considerable struggle and deceit, Marduk was given Egypt to rule. Anki really preferred to stay in the Absu, experimenting with his various projects, genetic and otherwise. So, he handed over the dominion of the River Nile and its surrounding territories to his lordship, Marduk. Marduk immediately set about building enormous monolithic statues of himself everywhere. These works of arts enhanced his beauty and were designed to intimidate or simply scare the pants off the looters. Rule by intimidation was Marduk's code. All the tyrants in Terra's history have been inspired in one way or another by Anki's firstborn. Because Egypt was Anki's domain, it was left to his offspring to regulate the weather patterns around the Nile to ensure water supplies and control flooding. Weather management on Nibiru is conducted with frequency regulators. On Terra, an electroplated gold satellite crossed the skies and through magnetic emission that you still do not understand, the amounts of water that form cloud cover in the skies over Terra were regulated. This procedure made the Lulas think we controlled the sun and that we were gods that they must worship. Marduk went right along with this, even calling himself the Lord of the Sun, Ra, and set up temples of worship for himself all over Egypt. He was extremely vain, always wanting his own way. Sun God, the Shining One, possessor of heaven and earth, 
and just about every other title to any of given to any of the gods was sooner or later acquired by Marduk. Even Anki was afraid of him. Marduk seemed to have the power to bend Anki's will in a sort of mind control son over father. All of Anki's strength would somehow vanish into Marduk and leave Anki powerless. We call the Great Pyramid in Giza the Akur, a word that means a house that is like a mountain. Anki and his sons built this Akur in Giza. Marduk laid out the site and then Gishzida, the son of Anki and Ereshkigal, installed the Palladian technology within. The pyramid was the primary generator of power used in all our space vehicles, the weather satellite disks, and the communication systems. Transmissions from the Pallades, our home planet, Nibiru, and the orbiting space station came at the time, at that time to the occur. Whoever controlled the Great Pyramid controlled power in the family. Marduk and Nergal began to fight for the command of the Akur. Marduk cloned himself into an army of fierce killing warriors, huge in stature and easily replaced. With his legions of clones, he attacked Nergal's army and a war ensued. When the sons of Marduk managed to seize the Akur, they were overcome by great greed and ambition fighting even among themselves they moved the legions toward the spaceport which belonged to Anki's brother Enlil provoking Enlil and the entire family with this outrage the sons of Marduk began a long and bloody family war at last splitting the family of Anu into two definite sides the Enlites and the Ankites Enlil would never allow the sons of his rival brother Anki to control both the Akur and the space sport. He could not place all communications from the Pallades, Nibiru, and the orbiting station in the hands of the Ankites. Enlil and his sons rose to the occasion. Ninurta was chosen to lead the Enlite's forces against Marduk. As the son of Enlil and Ninhasag, Ninurta lived to please his father, obsessively carrying out Enlil's orders and usually succeeding. I have always found Ninurta to be a strange person, extremely self-centered, with a chip on his shoulder, a sort of brat. Being the center of his mother's world had left him with a few unpleasant characteristics. And Ninurta and I fought savagely as children. But this time we fought together on the same side. As the granddaughter of Enlil, I am an Enlite by birth, and I was at last pleased to see Ninhasag's son winning battles for my side of the family. My other father, my own father, Nanar, was also commanding armies, and I insisted on getting into the battle. I had achieved the level of Golden Falcon in the mastery of arms. I actually fought at Ninurta's side, once bringing him a weapon he greatly needed. I suspect it was the only time he was ever truly glad to see me. The war was indescribably ghastly and we used the Lulas as soldiers. Occasionally entire villages happened to be in the paths of the great radiation waves and innocent Lulas died by the thousands. Many more starved to death in Nurgle's African domain because Ninurta evaporated all the waters in the rivers and scorched the land with his plasma fire. Ninurta also used what you would call chemical warfare, the terrible Mahava missile poisoned everything in his sight. There were many types of weapons of destruction used, but the most cunning of all was the Rude Adra weapon. It produced a hologram of vast armies of charging demons and monsters, armed with plasma guns and screeching, blood curling war cries. Marduk's Lula armies could never imagine it was only an apparition, and they turned and ran, leaving his clones to face Ninurta's legion alone. Toward the end of the war, Ninurta managed to flood the Absu forcing Anki and his sons to retreat into the Great Pyramid. From the protection of the Akur, 
the Onkites generated a wall of poisonous light around the complex. This wall was a force field fueled by the considerable capacities of the Great Pyramid itself. No weapon of ours could penetrate it. Ninurta summoned my twin brother Utu and ordered him to cut the Akur off from all water sources. Without water, how long could they live? Desperation forced one of Anki's younger children to make a daring effort to escape and run for water. In his courageous attempt, the poor boy was blinded by Ninurta and his brilliant weapon. One family member actually severely harmed another. This had never occurred before. Even Marduk had used assassins to kill my husband Dumuzi. And so Ninhasag stepped in. She had seen enough. It was bad enough for us to slaughter her looters, but to kill and maim the members of our own family was intolerable. She commanded her son and nurse to give her a radiation suit, and then she slowly walked towards the occur. No one would ever dare to strike Ninhasag. Not even Mondu. She is the daughter of Anu, and you can bet that Anki was feeling very nervous as she ordered him to lower the poisonous wall. The peace negotiations began. Ninhaseg informed Anki and his sons that Anu had given her the authority to put a stop to this madness. Anki was ordered to surrender immediately to Enlil. Anki looked to Marduk for consent, and Marduk relented. In those days, Marduk was still afraid of Anu. This brings us to an end of chapter 9. When we return, we will be on chapter 10, The Occur. Um, free Larry Hoover. Thank y'all for coming out. God bless you. Good night. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe positively. Your feedback is greatly appreciated. Also, don't forget to follow me on IG at wisdom underscore is underscore jive. And that's on IG. Appreciate you.